Has it been a good week? I think so too. We've had a good time visiting with Dr. Anthony. Um, We've had a chance to do some social things with him as well. And I think that uh, you've had an opportunity to see his heart a little bit as he's uh, ministered to us through these great chapel messages. We've had a chance to uh, see him when we visited in faculty meeting and some of his story and what God has done in and through his life uh, over the years. And uh, we're excited. I'm personally excited about where he is and what he's doing and what God is doing through him and his kids. And um, it's, it's been a real blessing for us to, to get to know him and to have him here on campus today. So let me pray for him and for us as uh, we come into our last chapel message this morning. Father, thank you for this great week of opportunity to get to know you better, to get to know ourselves better and the relationship that we have with you. Lord, it is our lifelong quest as believers to know you better, to understand your mind, your heart, as we've learned this week. Lord, you do require and expect us to follow you, to desire to know you, so that the way that we live and the things that we do honor you, glorify you, and ultimately point people to you. Lord, use us as your ambassadors each and every day. You've called us to be your children, to represent you in every sphere of influence. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to prepare for that here at Dallas Seminary. Thank you for the ministries and the influence that you've given to each one of the students that are here and the faculty and the staff and the way that you use all of us for that purpose. Thank you for Dr. Anthony, for the journey that you've taken him on, for the things that he has experienced that bring him to this point in his life when he can share from his heart and demonstrate to us his servant leadership. We ask you to bless him and the ministry of the Dream Center and all the work that they're doing and the families and the the ladies and the children that they're influencing, Lord, um, I have to believe that you're smiling because of what he's doing and for the work of that particular organization. So bless him today as he brings his final message to us that we would have the ears to hear um, and that we would um, trust you to guide us and direct us and to show us the way. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Dr. Anthony. Thank you very much, Jay. I thought it would be appropriate on this last day to uh, ride into chapel on a yellow bicycle, but for the life of me, I couldn't find one. (laughs) That's, That's been a unique cultural experience this week for me to... It's like you're tripping over these bikes all over the city. <laughs> what were they thinking? <laughs> well, maybe they weren't. That's the problem. Anyway, be that as it may, uh, this week uh, has been a real joy for me to be here. I've been speaking a uh, four-day lectureship series, uh, the Griffith Thomas Lectureship. Uh, he was born, I, I guess he, he was born in, in England as were my parents. He was Anglican, as was I when I was growing up, since I was born in Canada. Uh, He lived in uh, Toronto. I was born in Windsor, just a few miles away. He moved to Philadelphia. I guess that's where our paths would have separated. So that means he would have been a Philadelphia Eagles fan uh, last week. I'm I'm just saying. I'm I'm just, you know, I'm thinking. But uh, I've been speaking on the subject or the theme of the heart of God. Uh, I recall in the very first message that in all my years of uh, attending and graduating from three seminaries, uh, having taught in a half a dozen for over 35 years now, I can't really remember ever studying the heart of God. I had my head filled with things about God, but I knew so little about the heart of God, those things which prompt and motivate and stir him to action. And so I've been addressing several issues related to that. On on the first day, Tuesday, I talked about a a biblical theology of the heart of God where we looked through a series of verses, specifically 26 of the Old Testament, that, that address and identify the heart of God. And then we looked at some verses in the New Testament related to the heart of Jesus and and how Jesus reflected the heart of his Father. 
Uh, the next day we talked about the heart of God in relationship to the preparation of ministry leaders and how God desires to prepare, equip, and train ministry leaders for service. Uh, yesterday we talked about the heart of God in relationship to social engagement. Uh, we talked uh, very extensively about how, how God is uh, very tender in his heart towards those who are poor and disenfranchised and trafficked and, and uh, immigrants and those in our society who are sort of set off to the side. And God's heart is very tender towards them. Today I'll be talking about the heart of God in relationship to the church. Uh, in essence, once God is determined in his heart to do something, whether it is in the present or in the future, uh, once God has purposed to do something in his heart, whether it's in the past or is going to take place, it is already set. As far as he's concerned, it has come to pass. Why would God change his mind? To do otherwise would be to undermine the immutability of his character. So when we talk about the heart of God, we're not talking about the human heart like a pump that pumps blood through the body. We're not talking about that kind of heart. We're not even talking about the, the heart that reflects emotion, although God is, uh, he does oftentimes in Scripture uh, allow us to glimpse into a, an emotional component or dimension of him. We cited that the other day when we, when we uh, referenced the verse in the Old Testament where God regretted in his heart that he made Saul king over Israel. There's a certain emotional piece there, but the vast majority of references that talk about the heart of God, talk about the will and the determined desire of God to do something. And so today we turn our attention to the heart of God as it pertains to the church. Ultimately, the church should be regarded as, as important to Christians because it's important to Christ. Christ founded the church. According to Matthew 16, 18, he purchased it with his blood. Acts 20, 28, and ultimately he identifies himself with it. Acts 9, 4, the church is described as the body of Christ, the dwelling place of the Spirit, and the chief instrument for glorifying God in the world. And finally, the church is God's instrument for bringing both the gospel to the nations and a great host of redeemed humanity to himself. The New Testament cites a variety of metaphors for the church. Some include the human body, some the bride, the family, an army, a holy priesthood, a sheep field, a grapevine, a field, an olive tree, a holy nation, a temple of God. The list goes on and on and on. And since we have such a limited time in this presentation, I want to focus just on three of them. When we talk about a metaphor, what is the purpose of a metaphor? Metaphors are one of the most extensive literary devices that are used to help us gain an understanding into something that may be unknown to us. Interest in literary devices is scarcely new. Under categories such as metaphor or type, Christians have dealt with literary aspects of the biblical text for centuries. The essence of a metaphor is to bring understanding and experience to something that is unknown. In their book, Metaphors That We Live By, authors George Lakoff and Mark Johnson argue that our thought processes are largely metaphorical, and thus metaphors create reality because changes in our conceptual system affect how we perceive the world and act upon those perceptions. Take, for example, the popular metaphor that we use here in the United States, that time is money. Now, we know that time actually is, is an abstract concept. So we use a metaphor to help describe what time is to help us bridge the gap between what is known and what is unknown. We use it in comparison to something that we know and understand because that helps us then bring understanding to something that we need clarity for. We say that we are guilty of wasting time. We claim to be able to save time. We say someone is living on borrowed time. Some people give time away. Some are fortunate enough to figure out how to invest time, while others do things that cost them time. All of these descriptions are our attempt to use metaphor to bridge the known to help us understand the unknown. Every time we use time as a resource metaphor, in essence, we are reinforcing this perspective. 
Biblical metaphors are very similar. They allow us to understand more clearly the mysteries of God. They stir the mind to understand the representation or comparison of something that is being made in the biblical text. Biblical metaphors can add vividness and make abstract ideas more concrete. It illustrates something about our subject that that can be perceived through the use of a metaphor. For example, the psalmist speaks about how deep God's love is. He uses the image about the father's love to the son. In Psalm 103, verse 13. Now such language engages our heart as well as our mind because it taps into something very deep within us that might otherwise remain untouched or unseen. But the danger in metaphor, particularly using a metaphor as a figure of speech, is that it presupposes a certain body of knowledge on the part of the listener. If, for example, you have never known the father's love, or perhaps your earthly father's experience was negative or abusive, using a metaphor of of a loving heavenly father may not communicate its intended meaning. At worst, it might even communicate something that is false or unintended in the message. So, understanding such risk, I embark on a lecture intended to illuminate a concept that I believe God wants us to understand with crystal clarity. My objective in this fourth and final lecture is to elucidate the heart of God as it relates to the church. In order to accomplish this, I want to employ three biblical metaphors that God uses to help us understand the importance that God places on the church. There are nearly 100 such metaphors in the New Testament, images that reveal the church and what it is theologically. Our three metaphors today are the body, the bride, and the family. Each is, has a fairly common metaphor and is not intended by God to be cryptic or in any way shrouded in mystery or enigmatic. Let's first take a look at the metaphor of the human body to understand the heart of God as it pertains to the church. The Apostle Paul uses the metaphor in letters to believers at the churches in Rome, Corinth, and Ephesus to help them understand the nature and purpose of the local church. Here he describes the church as being made up of different members, similar to that which comprises the human body. A sampling of verses that relate to this subject are Romans 12, 4 to 5. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. 1 Corinthians 10, 17 says, we who are many are one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one, so it is with Christ. A little bit later in that same chapter, we read, so you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. Ephesians 4, equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. A little later in the next chapter, Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Lastly, in chapter 5, we are the members of Christ's body. See, the body of Christ as a metaphor for the church is unique to Pauline literature and constitutes one of the most significant concepts therein. The primary purpose of this metaphor is to demonstrate the interrelatedness of diversity and unity within the church, especially with reference to the spiritual gifts. As believers and followers in Jesus Christ, our spiritual well-being depends on our connectedness to one another in order together to comprise the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the word body appears 18 times. Paul's conclusion in this chapter is that we must be connected to each other in order to be what God wants us to be. In essence, we really do need each other. It's abundantly clear in this and other related passages that each body part is essential for the well-being of the body as a whole. Just as the physical body is weakened if one part is missing or ailing, so it is with the spiritual body as well. 
Each spiritual gift that is given by God through the Holy Spirit is essential for the entire body's well-being. Knowing this helps us understand the heart of God as it relates to the nature and the purpose of the church. The biblical metaphor illustrates how important it is to God to see us accept, embrace, and welcome each member as important to the body. No part should be held in contempt, shunned, or discredited in any way. Unity in the body of Christ is at the heart of how God intends the body to operate on earth. His intended will as, and his expressed desire is for every member of the body of Christ to get along, to work together in harmony towards one purpose, and to focus our energies towards accomplishing his expressed intentions in the church. I think at last count, there's 54 different Baptist denominations. Think about that. Can there really be that much difference? I know some in studying church history, some denominations split over one word. How utterly absurd. That cannot possibly be the heart of God that his church is fragmented that much. And that's just one denomination. I mean, Presbyterian split, Lutheran split, Methodist split. I mean, you, you name the denomination, it's fragmented. What is God's intended purpose? What is his heart's desire? We find that. And the Pauline epistles tell us that the intended desire and, and, and what God desires for his church is to be one, that we would serve together in one regardless of the distinctives that we think are so important. These intentions would include three things. First of all, to proclaim the gospel message of salvation in Christ. Secondly, to provide a measure of God's grace and mercy, both the here and the now. As I talked about yesterday, how we can reach the broken, the lost, the, the disenfranchised, the trafficked, within our own community, to do that in the name of Christ, as the body of Christ, the hands and feet reaching out, getting dirty. And thirdly, the intention is to employ each gift of that body in order to use them for kingdom purposes. There are somewhere around 28 spiritual gifts mentioned in the scriptures, depending on your definition and your particular faith journey. While we may disagree on which ones are still active today, nevertheless, the argument has to be made that the purpose of the gifts is that each one of us bring that to the table to do something in the world, to proclaim Christ, to bring the lost and broken to him, and to serve the needs of those around us in the name of Christ. Secondly, let's take a look at this second metaphor, the church as the bride of Christ. Second metaphor I'd like to explore is that of the bride. Marriage is a metaphor very prominent in the New Testament. The image of marriage, however, is also applied by God to Israel in the Old Testament. The Old Testament occasionally used the image of a bride together with other aspects of nuptial imagery to depict Israel's relationship to Yahweh. This bridal imagery primarily emphasizes devotion and the joy of the bride coming into relationship with the groom. Similar imagery is applied to Christ and the church in the New Testament. As a metaphor, the bride of Christ denotes intimacy, closeness, and loving proximity. A bride and her husband share a bond like no other. There is a deep and abiding commitment that transcends the trials and the turbulence of life. And speaking of this lasting bond, one author writes, the union of man and woman in marriage is a mystery because it conceals, as in a parable, the truth about Christ and the church. The divine reality hidden in this metaphor of marriage is that God ordained a permanent union between his son and the church. Human marriage is an earthly image of his divine plan. As God willed for Christ and the church to become one body, so he willed for marriage to reflect this pattern. And the husband and the wife become one flesh. The Apostle John also found the metaphor of Christ to be very helpful in explaining the nature and the purpose of the church. In the book of Revelation, he pictured the church as a bride, the Lamb's bride, in her eschatological glory. Especially prominent in this portrait is the church dressed in white, 
her clothes indicating a blamelessness in her nature. The promises given to the local church at the beginning of the apocalypse are that those who overcome will be clothed in white garments and will be allowed to come into his presence. Those martyred for witnessing faithfully to Christ will be given a white robe according to Revelation 6.11. Revelation 7.14 tells us that a multitude from the nations comes out of the great tribulation wearing robes made white with the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 19 verses 7 through 9 tells us that the glorious church is blessed because it will be called to the marriage supper of the Lamb where she is given fine linen, clean and bright to represent her righteous acts. What a beautiful picture this is the union of Christ with his bride. These references help us as God's people to understand God's priority, his heart, specifically as it relates to the nature and the purpose of the church. The intimacy that exists between Christ and his bride is characterized in scripture as being pure, righteous, and marked by faithfulness. And a marriage relationship worthy of the most wonderful and glorious celebration that will ever be seen in eternity. It will usher in a new age and a dimension of relationship between God and man. How glorious will that day be? So to illustrate this, let me highlight a couple of verses. Ephesians 5, verses 31 and 32. Therefore a man shall leave his mother and father and hold fast to his, his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying this because it refers to Christ and the church. Revelation 21.9, come and I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And then also in that book, chapter 19, the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was, a, it was granted to her to be clothed in linen, pure and bright. The apostle Paul in his second letter to the Corinthian church highlights this metaphorical depiction of the church as the bride. For in chapter 11 he writes, for I feel a divine jealousy for you. Since I betrothed you to one husband, this is Paul writing to the church, to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. He pictures himself as the father of the bride, whose ultimate purpose is betrothing the church of God in Corinth to her heavenly bridegroom, Jesus Christ, who is present at the last days. Third and finally, the church as a metaphor for the family of God. When we look at the metaphor of the church as a family of God, we see it like a parent. It might have been somewhat dysfunctional in your own personal experience, but nonetheless, according to Scripture, it, likes, it, it acts and it likens itself to the family. Until recently, for the most part, we understood what a family was. It's changed over the years. There was a time, at least for myself growing up, when you talked about family, it was pretty obvious. We talked about two parents, male and female, and the presence of a child, or perhaps several, living in one location. Pretty simple, really. In biblical days, family was defined in broader strokes. They discussed family in the context of ancestries, such as grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, and a host of others related, albeit at times loosely, by blood. Tribes and clans and kinfolks are words that are used to describe this broader concept of family. And while there may be far more diversity in membership when using that such as a paradigm, that's not to say that these individuals have nothing in common, for indeed they do. For those who are included in the family of God, our commonality is drawn from our spiritual father, God. As the head of our spiritual family, we find our identity as his children by new birth and adoption. That in turn makes us related by spiritual blood to Christ. We refer to one another from the household of faith as brothers and sisters. It's been accurately said that there are no grandchildren in God's family. You're either a member of God's family or not, based upon a clear choice that you have made on the day of your conversion. One cannot join God's family because of a decision that their parents have made. There's a sampling, a few of these metaphorical references. 2 Corinthians 6, 18. I'll be a father to you, and you'll be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. 
Matthew 12, stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sisters and mother. Ephesians 2, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Lastly, 1 Timothy 5, 1, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Well, let me draw this series to a close. And to provide some final thoughts as I wrap up four days of trying to unpack what it means to understand the heart of God. We began by examining the various Old Testament references to the concept of what it means to know the heart of God. New Testament references were somewhat less obvious unless you look at the life of Christ as a reflection of the heart of his Father. We certainly see this when Jesus says to Peter, and Peter, or Philip, and Philip asks him in John 14, Lord, show us the Father, and it'll be enough for us. And Jesus, I think, probably scratched his head and said, Philip, have I been with you so long that yet you still not know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? In essence, the actions of the Son reveal the heart motives of the Father. So let me take a moment and perhaps take a little bit of a different tack. What about your heart? We've been talking about God's heart for four days. Let me just wrap up in the last five minutes and say, what about your heart? What do the scriptures teach about the state and the condition of your heart? I remind you of a verse I read earlier in this series from 2 Chronicles my life verse, where the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the whole earth, that he might show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is completely his. In essence, to know your heart is to know your motives, your thoughts, and your priorities. In Hebraic thought, the heart is comprehensive in its operations as the seat of the intellect affective, volitional, and the religious life of a human being. They were all intertwined. You couldn't dissect them and pull them apart. And because of this ultimate and vital role, to know a person's heart is to know the actual person. It's a mirror image of the man or woman. As Proverbs 27, 19 says, as in water, face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects man. Since the heart holds the key to one's essential makeup, its content and condition should be regularly examined. Watch over your heart with all diligence, admonishes the author of Proverbs 4.23, for from it flow the springs of life. In the third chapter of 1 Kings, we read that God came to Solomon in a dream and asked him, Name it, claim it, what favor do you want me to do for you? Well, Solomon ponders for a moment and he asks God for wisdom. Wisdom and knowledge so that at this young age he might rule his people, that is God's people, with integrity, according to verse 10. In essence, Solomon desired a heart that was soft and sensitive, to be able to discern right and wrong, to make wise decisions, and to rule in such a manner that he received God's favor. So God granted the young king his desires. And as we read further in the chapter, added a significant number of additional blessings as well. While we do not know the precise age at which Solomon became king, most scholars would say somewhere in his early 20s. We know from 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 42 to 43, that he reigned for 40 years. And in the same chapter, it is recorded six times that Solomon's heart had grown cold and had turned away from God. Worldly temptations had eroded that first love and slowly and at times perhaps imperceptibly, his heart had grown cold. He died spiritually impoverished, a derelict of a godly leader. So if it could happen to someone who began his administration with a personal visit from God, it can certainly happen to you and to me. 
So it behooves us to guard our own hearts and to protect them from the forces that would seek to destroy it. For make no mistake, there are forces out there that seek to destroy your heart. So knowing this, Scripture admonishes us to guard our hearts and to be watchful over what we allow to influence it. For once tainted, the heart is hard to restore. We know, of course, that Jeremiah warns us the heart is deceitful above all things. Who, who can trust it? Now that's not to say that the Holy Spirit is incapable of remaking, reshaping, and redeeming man's heart. I am the recipient of such a transformation, and for that I'm sincerely grateful. Surely the, surely the inner working of the Holy Spirit can and should have a marked improvement over the condition of our heart. In the book of Galatians, we're told the evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in our life is a changed heart. These fruit of the Spirit, as they're presented in chapter 5, provide ample evidence of the redemptive work of God's Spirit and how we can change in the condition of our heart. As such, it will be subsequently seen in our actions and the manifestations of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, for these must first emanate out of a changed heart before they can be evidenced throughout the world. I conclude with the words of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry in his infamous novella, The Little Prince, which, by the way, is the most translated book in human history. 300 languages and dialects, with over 140 million copies. And he writes... It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we know that you do not look at the outward appearance of the, of the man, or the woman, but you are looking internally. You're looking at the heart. Father, we've spent four days trying to examine through the pages of your revealed word your heart, that which prompts you to action, that which draws you to do something on behalf of mankind and his need. And we're grateful that, in, that while we were yet sinners, you saw us in our need and sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross on our behalf. And it was because of your heart of compassion and mercy that you draw us into a relationship with you. And now, Father, we are the church, the visible body of Christ. I pray that you would help us to draw together in unity, regardless of gender, socioeconomic, racial, the geopolitical divides that the world feels are so important. God, in the Holy Spirit, may we break those down and represent your character, your heart, to a lost and needy world. For if they don't see it in us, the church, how will the world ever see you? Father, may our heart be touched by the things that touch your heart. And may they prompt us to action, to reach out with the hands and feet of Jesus to a lost and broken and needy world. Thank you for what we've learned about your heart. And also these last few moments about the warning about our own heart. May they be knit together through your Holy Spirit, for I ask in Jesus' name, amen.